Well, today's sermon comes from Acts chapter 12. We're looking at Peter when he's in prison. One of the times Peter's in prison. Um, as you go through Acts, and in your Sunday, if you were in Sunday school today, um, yesterday, last week and this week, you know that Peter was in jail. And that's a preliminary to today's sermon, that Peter was in jail. How did he react to that imprisonment? And that's what we're going to look at. And But we, we know, and, and that big idea for this sermon, we know that Peter didn't fret. He said instead of fretting and worrying while he was in jail, because who, which, who of us wants to be in jail? Um, I know some people in here have been in jail. I've only visited as a visitor. I have a brother currently in jail. Um, you may know somebody that's been in jail. But instead of fretting and worrying, Peter slept in the knowledge that he was in the hands of the Almighty God. Because Peter was in jail for a righteous reason. If we go to jail here in America, most of us, it's for an unrighteous reason. We, we broke the law. We did something unholy. We don't go to prison for following Christ. Not in America. Some other countries, but not in America. And so we start here in Acts chapter 12, which we'll cover in Sunday school in a couple months. Um, and it talks about King Herod. It's like, King Herod? He's still alive? Well, the King Herod you read about in, in, when Jesus' birth is King Herod the Great. And he died soon after that. All the other King Herods you read about in the New Testament are either King Herod's son or grandson. This is one of his grandsons, King Herod Agrippa I. And we know from history that he ruled in Jerusalem and the, and the surrounding areas from 41 to 44 A.D. Jesus died on the cross, we don't know exactly when, somewhere between the year 30 and 36 A.D., somewhere in that vicinity. We don't, the Gospels give us hardly any information on, on dates there. So some time has passed from Jesus' death and resurrection, his ascension into heaven that we read about in chapter 1 in Pentecost, to this. Some years have passed. It doesn't seem like that many years have passed when you read through the, gospel, read through the book of Acts, but some years have passed. And the church has been growing. But now persecution is coming. And in, in verse 2... It says that James, the brother of John, was put to death with a sword. And that's all we get. We don't get any sermon from James. We don't get any last words. We don't get his charges. And it's like, who's this James? Well, if some of you might remember the, the little kid song we used to sing, Peter, James, and John had a little sailboat. Yeah, that's that James. Peter, James, and John went on the mountain of transfiguration and saw Jesus changed. It's that James. James, the brother of John, the son of Zebedee, the sons of thunder, that James. Not to be confused with James that we read about later in, in Acts, the brother of Jesus, who wrote the book of James. Two guys, two different guys. But this James, this is all we get. He's just executed by King Herod. And we're going to read today's scripture. So if you are able to stand up and read, we're going to start in verse 3. James, um, Acts chapter 12, starting in verse 3. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, that's King Herod, he proceeded to, to arrest Peter also. And that was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out before the people. So Peter was kept in the prison, but prayer for him was made fervently by the church to God. On the very night Herod was about to bring forward Peter, he was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and guards in front of the door were watching over the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared, and light shone in the cell, and he struck Peter's side and woke him up, and saying, Get up quickly, and his chains fell off his hands. 
And the angel said to him, Gird yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and continued to follow. And he did not know what was being done by this angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. Verse 10, When they had passed the first and second guard, they came to the iron gate that leads into the city, which opened for them by itself. And they went out and went along the street, and immediately the angel departed from him. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I know for sure the Lord has sent forth his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod. For all, from all that, that the Jews, Jewish people were expecting. And when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who is also called Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. And when he knocked at the door of the gate, a servant girl named Rhoda came to him. And when she recognized Peter's voice, because of her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced Peter was standing in front of the gate. <laughs> they, said to, they said to her, you are out of your mind. But she kept insisting on it. They kept saying, it is his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when he had opened the door, they saw him and were amazed. But motioning them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had led him out of the prison. And he said, Report these things to James and the brethren. That's James, the brother of Jesus. And they left, and he went and went to another place. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for this scripture that it's here. I pray, Lord, that you will help your servant um, describe it, explain it, help us to open our hearts and our minds to what it has to say to us today. Because these are your words that you have put here. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Often we read scripture, and we just kind of read it monotone-like, because scripture is not always very descriptive. Sometimes they don't have a lot of adjectives. But this scripture here is interesting. If you really stop and look at it and think about it. So when an angel appears to somebody, and when you're ever in scripture and an angel appears to somebody, what does the person almost always do? They're, they're cower in fear. They fall down on the ground, and the angel has to say, do not fear not, do not be afraid, depending on your translation of the angel. So here's Peter. He's in prison. He's been arrested. He's been there for a few days. It doesn't say how many, but it was during the Feast of Unleavened, during the Passover time. This was the time when Jesus was arrested and executed and died on the cross. This is many years later, same holiday. He's in prison. He's got four squads watching him. Now, they're not all watching him at one time. They're taking turns. They're, they're, they're on a rotation. But making sure he's always watched, there's four squads of them, so they, 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 they rotate. And he's in jail. It's nighttime. What's he do? He falls asleep. I don't know about you, but being in, I don't know how well I'd sleep in jail. Now, they didn't even have beds. They just slept on the ground. But in those days, most people slept on the ground. Even in your own house, you slept on the ground. They didn't have nice big beds like we do. But he's sleeping. He's sleeping between two soldiers. All right? And he's chained to them. And the angel shows up with all its glory. Ta-da! Ready to say, do not be afraid. But what does he, but Peter is not in fear because Peter is what? He's snoring. <laughs> Why do I know this? Because what does it say next? The angel had to wake him up. It says he struck Peter's side. Peter, wake up. <laughs> Peter was that. And what did the angel have to do? He said, get up quickly. Peter got up and the chains fell off his hands. Miracle. The angel said, get, gird yourself. Apparently, Peter was a hot sleeper. He wasn't wearing all his clothes. He had to put his belt on. Hey, put on your sandals, Peter. Tie your sandals, Peter. And he did so. And then, he's, and then the angel said, get your cloak. Peter probably had it rolled up, used it as a pillow. Get your cloak. Put it on. Follow me. <laughs> he was out of it. He was sleeping. The angel's like, come on, dude. I'm rescuing you. And you're like, 
has to be told everything to do. How could he do that? I mean, I've slept through some stuff. When I was six years old, our mobile home trailer moved sideways about 10 feet, broke some windows. My mom apparently stood in the doorway and screamed. I only woke up when the neighbor guy was carrying me outside in the rain. And he goes, don't worry, everything's okay. And I remember thinking, as a six-year-old, I didn't know anything was wrong. <laughs> and I went back to sleep. I've seen the pictures. It's, it's kind of because the trailer wasn't anchored down. It was the 70s. They weren't all anchored down yet. It didn't roll, thankfully. There was trailers that did roll. Ours didn't roll. It, it was just a windstorm. It wasn't a tornado. But it was Kansas. <laughs> so I've slept through some stuff. I used to live 24 feet from the railroad tracks, and I slept through them. Peter slept through an angel showing up in prison. The angel had to wake him up, tell him what to do, get out of there. And he did. He followed him, and Peter thought he was just having another vision. If you go back to Acts chapter 10, Peter had a vision while he was waiting for his lunch. He had a vision. So Peter thought he was having another vision. But he followed the angel. Now think about it. If the Romans caught them at any point in time, he would have been immediately you know, executed, shot on the spot type of thing. But they got out. And then the angel left, and Peter's just left standing there blinking his eyes in the dark on the street. And he's like, he doesn't say how long he stood there, but he finally figured out, he's like, I'm not in jail anymore. Now i got to go do something. Where do I go? He went to the house of Mary, the mother of John Mark. John Mark is the Mark that rode the gospel of Mark. John Mark is the one Paul and Barnabas got in an argument over, and they split and created two missionary teams because of John Mark. Same guy. But the church is meeting at their house. So he goes there. He knocks on the door. And Rhoda must have been somebody important because they put her name in here. Because you think about most, there's a lot of places where we don't get a name of a person, but we get her name. And she sees Peter. Or hears his voice, and she's so excited, she forgets to open the door. <laughs> so an angel just miraculously got Peter out of jail, but he can't get in the house because the servant girl won't open the door because <laughs> they locked it. And she goes, tells everybody else, and they're, and they're saying, oh, you're crazy. Why are they there? They're praying. What are they praying for? Peter. He's outside. They think she's insane. They think that it's an angel. They had an idea of guardian angels too. And they thought your guardian angel looked like you. That's a scary thought, that your guardian angel looks like yourself. But that's kind of a Jewish thought they had of the day. Um, There's nothing in Scripture directly saying, hey, you have a guardian angel. But even as people today think we have guardian angels. And they might be named Clarence. Who knows? Um, So they thought it couldn't be really Peter. It's just his angel that's out there. And so they're, but she's going, no, it really is. And so they finally like, why don't we just go check? And they went and opened the door and there's Peter. And they're all going, ah! And he's going, keep it down. I just got out of prison. It's, It's... And he tells them what happened. He probably told me, told this, just told this story that the angel went everything that happened. And then him, and it says he, he left. I don't know if he left alone, but he went and found some other Christians to go hang out with. He goes, I need to get out of town. And so Bible stories aren't all boring. God's got a sense of humor. And so we got the story. Why is it here? Why did we put? Why did God put this story here? Why was Peter so out of it, and that the angel had to like tell him everything to do, tell a grown man to you know get up? And why was Peter sleeping so soundly that the angel had to kick him and wake him up? Well, Peter sleeps instead of succumbing to fear and anxiety. Now think about Peter's life up to this point. On the night that Jesus was arrested, Peter ran away with the other disciples. Now, he did sneak back in to watch Jesus' trial, but he had to sneak in 
and he did it, and he denied who Jesus was. He didn't want anybody to know who he was. He was hiding. And when that got found out, because the rooster crowed, what did he do? He ran away again and cried by himself. But he did return. Later, him and the rest of the disciples are standing there open mouth going, when Jesus was ascended into heaven in Acts chapter 1, and they just kind of stood there with their mouths gaping open going, ah, uh, what now? This is the same Peter. But then, 50 days later, or 10 days later after the ascension, the Holy Spirit comes, and he stands up in the temple, and he preaches a sermon. People were saved. And he kept preaching. And then he gets arrested in Acts chapter 4. He doesn't get out of that one. He spends the night. And he preaches to the Sanhedrin court, the ones that literally condemned Jesus to death. And he stands there and preaches to them. And saying that Jesus is the only name that, under heaven and earth that can save you. He heals people. Through, G through God, he heals people. And then he's arrested again. Him and the apostles are all arrested in chapter 5. And once again, an angel comes and lets them all out. What do they do? They go right back to the temple where they got arrested the next day and start preaching. They got arrested again. Went to another trial in front of the San same Sanhedrin court. This time they got flogged. Jewish flogging is 40 lashes, but they were afraid they miscounted, so they only do 39. Anybody here want to be flogged 39 times? I don't. And what did they do? They went away rejoicing. Peter is learning. He's learning. He helped appoint Stephen as one of the deacons, then was helpless to see, to stop Stephen being stoned to death. He was helpless to save his fellow fisherman and friend and fellow apostle, James, as he was executed. He is now helpless in stopping his own eminent execution. This was the night before his execution. He had been there for a few days. This was the last night in prison. What could he do? Nothing. So he slept. He wanted to be well rested for his last day on earth. He slept instead of succumbing to the fear of to fear and anxiety. He could sleep because he was in a win-win situation. Win-win. It's like, how in the world is that a win-win? Either he would live for Christ here on earth, or he would die and be with Christ in heaven. Paul says something similar. And he would see Jesus as he saw Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. He would see him like that. He already knew what Jesus looked like in heaven because he's already seen it. Him, James, and John. So he knew James was already there. And he's like, well, I'll be the next one. Nothing I can do about it. Might as well get some sleep. So Peter sleeps instead of worrying a fear and anxiety. That's a, some of us, me included, it's like that's a hard thing to figure out. Fear, not having fear and anxiety, that's like my... Every day, about everything. But what else? But Peter obeyed this angel. The angel comes from God. He obeyed. He didn't wait for clarity. Um, okay, angel, what's what's the game plan here? Um, you you want me to get up and get out of here, and then what? Then what are we going to do? How are we going to get out of here that the, the guards aren't going to see us? Because you're all kind of shiny, you know. What's the, what's, the, what's the game plan here? What's the long-term thing? What do I do once we get out? Then where do I go? He didn't ask all those questions. He goes, well, why would he? Well, Peter was a guy that asked those questions. Remember Jesus in, in Mark chapter 8, Jesus asked the disciples, who do, who do people say I am? And they answered, and they said, who do you say I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. And then he turned around and told Jesus, how to do his ministry because going to Jerusalem and dying is not the how you become the Messiah. 
he had, the, he, had, he had the gall to tell Jesus how to do things. And what did Jesus say? Get behind me, Satan. Jesus walks on the water. Peter says, hey, take me with you, Jesus. And Peter did. And then he sank. Because he started looking around at the storm. And Jesus says, oh, you of little faith, why, why did you doubt? On the Mount of Transfiguration I just referred to, they were up there. And Peter goes, um, why don't we like build three little shelters for Moses and Elijah and Jesus? And it says in, in, in Mark uh, chapter 9, in Peter's, it says Peter said this because he was terrified and didn't know what else to say. <laughs> it's like, uh, 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 why don't we? Because he didn't know what else to say. He had to say something. He was a man of many words. He had to say something. Peter was grieved when Jesus three times asked him, Peter, do you love me? And Jesus asked him three times, and he was grieved that Jesus would have the the audacity to ask him three times. How many times did Peter deny Jesus? Three times. I think he eventually got the point. Maybe not that day, but eventually he figured it out. Because Peter denied him. And then... At that same, that, that's John chapter 21, the last chapter of the Gospel of John. And then Jesus predicts that Peter will die. He says, someday somebody's going to lead you where you don't want to go. Implying the kind of way he's going to die. And so Peter has all this in his background. He's not worried about it. He realizes that he messed up in the past. But he understands what God's doing now. He doesn't need to put in his two cents worth. Just do what the angel tells him to do. He doesn't want to be told, get behind me, Satan, because he he's already had that happen. He doesn't want to be told, oh, you have little faith. Already had that happen. He didn't want to deny Jesus. Already did that. So he knew, i got to obey. Obey now. Don't need all the details. He may have been he told each little step and what to do to get out of prison, but he did it without question. He didn't ask, where are we going? His brain was foggy from sleep. It was dark. Something unusual was definitely happening. He could be killed on the spot if the Romans caught him, but he did not wait for clarity. He did not wait to know the entire plan. That is what God's word is. It says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Are you doing that even if you don't know what it's going to, when you are transformed, you don't know what you're going to become? Because you don't know, God starts transforming you, what's going to become of you? Because you might just be some silly little computer programmer sitting in his cubicle doing his thing. And then you might be standing up here. You might be the wife of the computer programmer. Now you see your husband standing up here. I don't know what God's got in the future for you. Jesus says to love one another. Do you need clarity on that? Well, do I have to love all of them? And Jesus is talking about his disciples. He's talking about Christian to Christian. Love one another. Well, look around this room. That means love everybody in this room. Well, what about that person over there or this, her over here? I don't know if I can love them. They're kind of weird. They don't dress like I do or some other thing. They don't talk right or they talk too well. I can't talk to them. They talk too well. They're smooth talker. No, love them. Love them if they make more money than you. Love them if they make less money than you. Love them if they're better educated. Love them if they're less educated. Love them if they're married. Love them if they're single. Love them if they're old. Love them if they're a kid. Just love them. Do it. Don't worry about what the results are. Just do it. Jesus says, love your enemies. Which ones? All of them. Well, I can love this enemy, but I don't know about that one over there. Eh, or this one over here. No, all of them. Even the ones that vote for the other party. Okay. 
All of them. Don't worry about the results are. Just do it. The way, same way Peter just followed the command of the angel, follow the commands of Scripture. Love one another. Love your enemies. Let God deal with the, all the details. Well, do you know what they did to me? No. Let God deal with the details. And then finally, what did Peter do? When he got out, he went and found others to share with. And you go, yeah, duh. Well, no, it's not duh. The prophet Elijah, great prophet, right? When he was threatened with execution by Queen Jezebel, what did he do? He ran away. He dropped off his servant, and he kept running by himself out into the wilderness, away from everybody else. What did Peter do when Jesus was arrested? He ran away. What did he do when he denied Jesus? He ran away. Peter didn't do that this time. When Peter and John, after they were arrested and after they were threatened in Acts chapter 4, what did they do? They went back to the church and they had a praise and worship service. It says the house shook. It wasn't from the base, okay? It wasn't from the subwoofer. It was from the Holy Spirit. They went back and worshiped together. The, once they, when the apostles got out of prison, and after they were flogged in Acts chapter 5, flogged, it says, they rejoiced because, quote, they were worthy to suffer shame for his name. They rejoice because they were flogged. If you lose a friend because of Jesus, rejoice. It's easy for me to say. It's hard for us to live. Peter eventually shares the joy of salvation with Gentiles in Acts chapter 10. So this time, Peter did not run and hide into the wilderness alone to escape the Romans and the Jewish leaders. He ran to his brothers and sisters in Christ. He shared the good news of answered prayers. He rejoiced that he was found worthy to suffer for Christ and that God the Father saw fit to rescue him once more. By going to his church, he uplifted them. They were rewarded by seeing the prayers answered. His presence was a blessing. Your presence is a blessing. Even the servant girl, Rhoda, who answered the door was a blessing to everyone. No matter your role, even if you do not think you have a role, you are a blessing. You are a blessing if you come to church and stand up here on this stage and sing and play a musical instrument. You are a blessing if you stand out here and sing from your seat. You're a blessing if you're here and you can't stand up anymore and you're still sitting. And you, even if you can't sing anymore, you're still a blessing if you're here. You're a blessing if you teach a class, no matter what age group you teach. You're a blessing if you repair drywalls and fix toilets. You're a blessing if you take out the trash. You're a blessing if you come here to worship. Someday, you may not be able to come to church anymore because of failing health or jobs or other things. I pray that we can be a blessing to you with no, our online sermons with a note written by somebody in the church, with a visit by somebody, a phone call. And we can pray for each other no matter where we are in the world. Peter found others to share with. We need to do the same. We need to do the same. So why is this here? Why is this whole comical situation here of Peter and the angel in jail? Why? Because we need to trust in the Lord, just like Peter did. He will rescue you, just like God did for Peter. Wait. Stephen followed God, and he was stoned to death. 
James was executed with the sword. John the Baptist was beheaded. All the apostles were flogged. Eventually, all the apostles were ex executed for their faith. John lived the longest, but in his old age, he was exiled from the churches he wanted to lead. Yes, Christians, we get sick. We get cancer. We're in car crashes. Our homes are hit with floods and tornadoes and hurricanes. Our employers file for bankruptcy and are bought out. The economy tanks. This world is filled with troubles. Bad stuff will happen. It's already happened. You will have the worst day of your life someday, if you haven't already. You will have days that stinketh, as King James would, stinketh. You might have a year that stinketh. You might think your whole life stinketh. You will have to attend funerals of those you love. But what do we have? In Hebrews chapter 11, what do we have? We have faith. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, the men of old gained approval. By faith, we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God. By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice. By faith, Enoch was taken up. By faith, Noah prepared an ark. By faith, Abraham obeyed. By faith, he, Abraham lived as an alien. By faith, Sarah received a child. And yet all these d d died in faith, not seeing the final blessing. By faith, Abraham offered up Isaac. By faith, Isaac allowed himself to be offered up. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau. By faith, Jacob blessed each of his sons. By faith, Joseph saved his brothers and his family. By faith, Moses was hidden. By faith, Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh. By faith, he left Egypt for who knows where. By faith, he kept the Passover after the Exodus. By faith, they passed through the Red Sea. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell. By faith, Rahab saved the spies. And then he lists Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel and all the prophets. Why? And all these, having gained approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised because God had provided something better for us so that apart from us, that we would, so apart from us, they would not be made perfect. God has something better for any, anything better that we have on this earth. No matter, there, there is no house that we can buy here on earth that is better than what we can get in heaven. There is no job on earth that's going to be better than any job in heaven. And thank God there's going to be a church in heaven that's way better than any church here on earth. By faith. Willie read First Peter chapter 4. Peter wrote that in his old age, after he had been through all this. And he could write that still. He had been through it, and he could still praise God. There's a doxology in that chapter. He could still praise God, because he knew someday he was going to die for his faith, because Jesus told him. He wasn't there yet. And he could still write that. And so if Peter could live it and write it, we can live it. We don't have to fear the unknown of this world. We don't have to fear what might happen. Because the only part that we need to worry about is what's going to happen in heaven. God's got this. It's easy for me to say some days. It's hard to live. Because some of us have a mind that's just wired to worry. 
and fret and think of every possible answer that could happen out there. If you're on a planning committee, make sure a warrior is on your planning committee because they'll think about all the things that you need to make sure you cover. God doesn't need a warrior on his planning committee. He's got it covered. And we can trust in that because it says it here. And we see how the men and women of old lived it. Because Peter was not some super Christian. He was just a fisherman. Without an education. Not much of one. He knew how to read and write, but he had no degrees. He was just a fisherman. And God used him mightily. So God can just use, I'm just a fill in the blank. Yeah, God can use that. He can use that. It may not be any great, huge thing. It just may be, you might be the shoe salesman that saves the, the, the evangelist, D.L. Moody. That may be it. You may only witness and only one person comes to Christ through your witness. But that person, who knows what they're going to do. And that's all God calls us to do. Be faithful. It doesn't say be successful. Be faithful. Let's pray. Lord God, we just come to you now. We praise you for all that you provide. We thank you for this event that happened in, in Peter's life. That he was faithful in this time and this place to follow you. And then we can read about it and praise God for it. We can laugh at all the things that are laughable, but yet know that you are always here. You are always with us and that you got this. We just pray this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen.